next we need to look at variable and absorption costing. So when preparing your statements of profit and loss and other comprehensive income, you can either use variable costing or alternatively you can use absorption costing. So what's the difference between these two approaches? With variable costing, we only include variable production costs in the cost of inventory and our fixed production costs are written off as period costs in the year in which they are incurred. So variable production costs get capitalized to the cost of inventory and they are treated as an asset. On the other hand, my fixed production overheads are expensed in the period incurred. How is this different with absorption costing? With absorption costing, both my variable and my fixed production costs are included in the cost of inventory. So that's the difference between these two statements. Why do we have two different statements? What's the purpose of these two different statements? Please note that variable costing is used for internal purposes. So variable costing is used for management accounts and for decision-making purposes. On the other hand, absorption costing is used for external reporting purposes because it complies with IAS 2. So if you are required to put together a set of annual financial statements for external use, you are then using absorption costing. Then please also just note the terminology. Variable costing can also be referred to as direct costing or marginal costing. So please don't get confused if they use the different terminology. Then in terms of arguments in support of variable costing and the arguments in support of absorption costing, I'm going to come back and I'm going to discuss this after we've looked at our example. After the example, this discussion over here will make a lot more sense. So remember we said that absorption costing complies with IAS 2. So we just need to quickly go through the requirements of IAS 2. So the first important thing that you need to be aware of is inventory must always be measured at the lower of cost and net realizable value. So in other words, if they tell us we have inventory with a cost of 100 Rand and a net realizable value of 80 Rand, we are then going to have to write inventory down to its net realizable value. So how do we write inventory down? We are going to credit inventory. And the other side of this journal entry is taken to cost of sales. So in this basic example over here, we are going to debit cost of sales with 20 Rand, credit inventory with 20 Rand, and we have then written down inventory to its net realizable value. Then you'll remember from the start of our lecture, I said to you that when inventory is sold, it is then recognized as an expense in the same period that the revenue is recognized. So you'll remember when a company sells inventory, they process two journal entries. One for the sale, and one to expense your inventory. So remember, this is your matching principle. Initially, inventory is treated as an asset. When the inventory is sold, in the same period that we recognize the sale, we then also expense the inventory. Then what costs are we allowed to include in the cost of inventory? Remember again, at the start of our lecture, we made a distinction between product costs and period costs. Period costs were things like marketing, admin, and selling costs. Those costs we do not include in the cost of inventory. They are expensed in the period incurred. On the other hand, product costs are included in the cost of inventory. And you'll remember product costs are made up of direct material, direct labor, and manufacturing overheads. 
Now, please note, we are looking at absorption costing over here. So it's very important to understand when I talk about overheads, I'm talking about my variable and my fixed overheads. Because we saw on the previous page with absorption costing, we include both our variable and our fixed production costs in the cost of inventory. So if this is IAS 2, we are going to include both fixed and variable costs in the cost of inventory. So please keep this in mind as we go through the next part of our discussion. So the first cost that we are allowed to include in the cost of inventory is your cost of purchase, or in other words, your direct material cost. So if the company buys any direct material, that is included in the cost of inventory. They are allowed to include any non-recoverable taxes. So for example, if the company can't claim the input VAT, they can then also include the VAT in the cost of the inventory. However, if the company can claim input VAT, then it is a recoverable tax. So if they can claim the input VAT, then you can't include the input VAT in the cost of the inventory. You can only include non-recoverable taxes. So if they can't claim the input VAT, then that can be included in the cost of inventory. You can also include any transport and handling costs in the cost of inventory. Any other costs to bring inventory into its present location and condition. So for example, if you have any import duties, that can also be included in the cost of inventory. This should then be net of any trade volume rebates. So for example, if a company buys their material in bulk and they qualify for a 10% discount, then when they record the inventory in their financial records, that should be net of the discount. So obviously, let's say we have a cost of 100 Rand and they get a 10% discount. When you record the inventory, you'll record the inventory net of the discount at 90 Rand. So obviously, what you actually pay for the inventory, taking that discount into account. Then we also include the costs of conversion. So once again, go back to the start of our lecture. Conversion costs are your direct labor and your overhead costs. So that obviously deals with the direct labor and your overheads. So you can see just below, the cost of conversion of inventories includes costs directly related to the units of production, such as direct labor, fixed and variable production overheads. Because remember, this is absorption costing, so we include both variable and fixed production overheads in the cost of inventory. Then I'm going to come back to the information in this block a little bit later. So for now, I just want you to see what this block includes, but I will come back and discuss all of this in more detail when we actually get to our example. The next paragraph, they tell us how to deal with the allocation of fixed production overheads. We are then told how to deal with variable production overheads. We are then told what to do in periods of low production and also what to do if we have abnormally high production. So I will come back and discuss all of those in more detail when we get to our example. So we've just looked at what the cost of inventory includes. We now need to look at what the cost of inventory excludes. So any abnormal waste must be excluded from the cost of inventory. Any storage costs are also excluded, unless they are necessary for the production process. So let's say, for example, we have a company that manufactures cheese. As a part of the production process, the cheese needs to age and mature. So storage is then actually necessary for the production process. So in that case, they are allowed to include the cost of storage in the cost of inventory. However, normally, if your storage is not necessary for the production process, then it cannot be included in the cost of inventory. In addition to that, any admin costs or any selling costs should also not be included in the cost of inventory. Because please remember, guys, both of these over here are period costs. And period costs are not included in the cost of inventory. They are expensed in the period incurred. 
Then the last thing that we need to look at in terms of IAS 2 are the different bases of inventory valuation or the different methods that we can use to value inventory. And there are four different methods. The first in, first out, or the FIFO method, the weighted average method, standard cost, or specific identification. Let's have a look at each of these in more detail. With the first in, first out method, we assume that the items of inventory that are purchased or produced first are sold first. Let's look at a quick example. On the 1st of January 20x4, there were 3,000 units in opening inventory, which cost 4 Rand each. During the month, an additional 10,000 units were produced at 6 Rand each, and 9,000 units were sold. And you need to calculate the value of closing inventory at the 31st of January 20x4. So first, before we actually calculate the value of closing inventory, let's calculate the number of units in closing inventory at the end of the month. At the beginning of the month, there were 3,000 units sitting in opening inventory. They produced an additional 10,000 units, and they sold 9,000 units. So at the end of the month, we have 4,000 units sitting in closing inventory. And we now need to value those 4,000 units using the first in, first out method. Now before I look at the formula with you, I want you to understand the logic of this calculation. If 9,000 units were sold during the month, we know with the first in, first out method, we assume that the items of inventory that are purchased or produced first must be sold first. So that means that these 3,000 units that are sitting in opening inventory must be sold first. So of the 9,000 units that are sold, 3,000 units will come from opening inventory. And the balance or the remaining 6,000 units will come from your current production. So that means at the end of January 20x4, do you agree this opening inventory is now gone? Those units have been sold. Current production for the month was 10,000 units. We've sold 6,000 of those units, so we have 4,000 units remaining. 4,000 units with a cost of 6 Rand each, giving me an inventory value of 24,000 Rand. So the logic of the first in, first out method is what you purchase or produce first must be sold first. So at the end of the month, the opening inventory is gone, and we only have our current production sitting in closing inventory, which is why we value those units at 6 Rand each. So of the 10,000 units that were produced this month, 6,000 units were sold, leaving 4,000 units sitting in closing inventory with a value of 6 Rand each. We only look at our current production costs because opening inventory should have been sold first. So let's look at the formula. You take your current production costs, you divide by your current production in units, and that is how you value inventory using the first in, first out method. So you ignore all of the units sitting in opening inventory and you only look at your current production. So they produced 10,000 units at a cost of 6 Rand each. So that is my current production cost. My current production in units was 10,000 units, giving me a cost of 6 Rand per unit, multiplied by the 4,000 units sitting in closing inventory, gives me a value of 24,000 Rand. Let's then look at how this differs if we have to value the inventory using the weighted average method. Now with the weighted average method, we lump together all of our inventory and we calculate an average price. So, look at how your formula differs. We are not only looking at our current production costs and our current production in units, but we also take opening inventory into account in this calculation. So what we do is we take 
the units in opening inventory multiplied by the cost, the current production multiplied by the cost to give us our total cost of all inventory. So get your total cost of all inventory. Divide by the total number of units so that you can get a cost per unit. So the total number of units is the 3,000 units in opening inventory plus the 10,000 units that were produced during the month. That gives me an average price of 5 Rand 54 per unit. We then multiply that by the 4,000 units sitting in closing inventory in order to value our closing inventory at the end of January 20x4. So please note the difference between the first in first out method and the weighted average method. With the first in first out method, we only look at our current production and our current costs. We ignored the opening inventory. However, with the weighted average method, you can see we also take opening inventory into account. We lump together all of our costs and we work out an average price. And all of our inventory is valued at that same average price. Inventory can also be valued at standard cost. However, I don't want you to worry about that too much for now because we will be looking at standard costing in a separate lecture. And lastly, inventory can also be valued using the specific identification method. And this is for items of inventory that are not ordinarily interchangeable, or in other words, unique items of inventory. So let's say, for example, we have a company that manufactures expensive and unique inventory. So for example, a furniture manufacturer or a vehicle manufacturer, where each item of inventory is unique. In that case, each item of inventory is going to have to be valued separately because each item is unique, and that is obviously going to be very time-consuming. 